Thank you for listening to True Crime 49. Season 3, Women Hunted, traces the progression of Robert Hansen, an Alaskan serial killer known as the Butcher Baker. Listener discretion is advised. Not for the sake of these two poor girls, the FBI profiler was ridiculed when he spoke plainly of his theory, pairing the aged old term, mode of operation, with a new word. The scene and the tools would change, he said, for what's best in any situation, but it was his signature that you would see emerging from all of his crimes. Perfected in daydreams from behind the bars across the river, the same fantasy making it real in the real world played out wherever. It will technically always be the same victim for him. The sequence alive in his eyes even after two years, the first girdle is there with him again, blurry over the new girl now. His wild humping pelvis chasing ecstasy as she appeared for him in the most unholy of resurrections. Welcome to True Crime 49. It was in 1793 when a storm sent the Russians' massive limping ship up into the Narrows. The bay was long and endless until eventually the fat cats were anchored and standing on the shore amongst the massive trees, as wet, dirty men were laboring at leather pumps and buckets splashing water from the ship's belly. So it was coming down in sheets down the wall of the tarry timbers. The floor was at a funny angle. As she was settling in slowly, inevitable, down into the cold water. Half the world away from home, but that's why they had the Englishman shipwright on the books. Three giant masts that are fastened down into the shipwork, and they would take her apart at the seams, and rebuild a new boat, felling the trees they come down like terrible ancient towers man hours to fragment them into every shape you could imagine and fitted the new ship and they sailed out like a valiant this time a port in the storm and had been on easter so they named the massive bay after the lord's rising and they glittered upon the water in the hollow wind they had burned more trees than 20 of these boats for charcoal and the blacksmith's nails and bolts freshly made the hammers tinging by crackle flames. In the resurrection bay, the red ochre paint they made from the land, and they painted the name of the ship the Phoenix. Passing the sheer stones of Cain's head, they rejoiced at their accomplishment. According to the New York Times, the only reason to visit Seward is Resurrection Bay, a place where you get on a boat and leave to fish, hunt, to see the bay and the fjord. For most, Seward is where you bought a postcard or visited the Sea Life Center, but for a few, it's the biggest city in the area. In the 1970s, it had a grand population of 1,500 people, supporting the ever-growing tourism and economy. The diver is slipping downward in the cold teal ocean somewhere across from Kane's Head. The murky horizon of rocks below him seem to be coming upward in the reflection of the glass mask. As he sinks, they become clearer and the stones are boulders the size of cars, each gap making garbage bag sized crevices between them. And as he approaches, there are eyes looking up at him, clittering legs clackering sideways into the shadows. The invisible rockfish seen is only a black eye upon the wall of blotchy stone. In the eyeball there is a gold copper ring and it is watching at any moment ready to pulse its back full of spines and shatter the water away in a burst of escape. A second diver and then a third descend upon a scene from up out of the light and they loiter about looking down into a world of broken dumpsters, every shadow being the clinging home of some scavenger. Later ascending with their bubbles floating next to them like rolling boils suspended. They break the surface and pull themselves up out of the water onto the guy's boat. He is scrawny, but down there he can really move. 
The troopers did say later that when they brought him out to identify the burial spot of some girl he had put there, handcuffed and in the snow, they said that it was frightening how he bounded across the terrain like an animal, they said. The divers had been talking in town and this really nice guy had a boat. From his boat that spring they dropped in on the perfect habitat of the sea cucumber. They had sold some and that night they fried a basket full of them and drank beers. The cold wind whistles out here now across the empty deck. The waves are lifting the boat as if gliding smoothly over coffee tables. Every once in a while the boat comes down and a wave slaps the hull and white foam sprays up over the side. The scrawny guy with the boat is looking out into the trees on the land, his arms spread out looking into the shadow of the forest in there, lifting up over coffee tables, the slap of an errant wave, the foam pops into the air and the man spins to the wheel and the throttle. The idling motor clunk pops into gear, the propeller beginning to whir as the front of the boat going down in a roller, coming up she is turning in, pushes towards the heavy waves that are breaking on the smooth stones. Eventually one day the conditions were right, and he stepped out of the little dinghy and across the beach and he stepped through the broomsticks and the green curtain of alders and it opened up into the damp, cool world in the shade of the giant spruce trees. And there it was. He walked up to the little cabin. It had all the things that you'd expect. When the two old lovers spoke of their secret cabin, he was pretty sure he knew already where you would build something like that. And here it is. Watching her little Macon grow from a child at happening so swiftly, Mother was half surprised when her young woman walked up during a brief lunch, announcing that she'd made her mind up and she was going to Avtech. It's the only post-secondary education component of its kind. It's part of the state of Alaska, her tone speaking certainty. That little furl in her brow she would get. Her mother knew it was there now, but she couldn't look up just yet. It's still in the state, she says to her mother. She was so proud of her. So many truths already shown, some of them flashing then across the deep clouds in the mother's eyes. Walking by, catching a glimpse through the board slit, mother had stopped to look, seeing the little girl letting herself into the pen of the working horse. Walking in with her belly out, chastising him for some infraction. The horse burrs and she's on a little stool combing his beautiful hair and she's talking to him. And he closes his giant eyelash so gently as the little brush rakes by and she's telling him something. Mother lifts her eyes to her beautiful young woman standing at the head of the table. Mother felt her heart cave in that first time the motorcycle on the dirt coming around again and it went over the well-worn mound, the noisy lifting bike, off the ground. And she recognized it was Megan on the bike, and she was so angry, but also in awe of her little daughter, standing like a champion as the tire touched down and dug in. The gas went full throttle, the tire coming loose, and it was floating recklessly as she tore away like a chariot. Those nights she would go in and kiss her on the forehead as she slept. There are comforting words that are wrapped softly around the cold hard truth that she's going. And when she tells her she hasn't committed to one of the trades yet, welding, electrical, boat captaining, any job that supports the oil and ocean industries. I've waited un until now to tell you though, the mother flashes a warning look at her child. They're offering a course on commercial bakery. The mother is taking it in, the arc welder, the grinders and the spark showers of flying metal. All of those things slipping away, the mother lifts an eyebrow, it's pretty good. Avtech, 
commercial baking course. It was such a relief that night she peeked in on her daughter, a young woman now I guess. And she was awake of course, listening quietly to her rock and roll. They sat on the bed and they talked and they talked deep into that night. Megan Emmerich was 17 years old, standing a little over five feet with brown hair and hazel eyes. Raised in Delta Junction, 332 miles north of Anchorage, with her brothers. As the growth of the state was becoming more evident, Megan left her small town of 700 for better schooling and opportunities. Seward is a town that the barge sees, unloading with a mountain and a river of food and tires and heavy equipment, clothes, appliances, military cargo, the ship sea coming in from the horizon of waves and finally coming up to bump into the wood piling scent of tar. And they see the glint of those railroad tracks, years upon years of it. They built an Avtech school. It's the only post-secondary education component of its kind. It's part of the state, Alaska actually. Training students hands-on on boats, power plants, support businesses even. It blesses people with the hope that they can make a living almost immediately. They also built for them in Seward a brand new facility. It's pretty big. And it is a source of revenue for that town and families buying homes, getting gas at the gas stations. The breakfast diner that looks out over the harbor. There are two tables put end to end along one wall. They never move and they are intermittently full of officers together before the shift, their bad spells in brass and leather, the Department of Corrections. The prison sits around the bend. Lowell Point is south of town on the other side, but you can still make it out from across the river. The rehabilitation process is just that, a process. It takes time, and then it takes transition. The poor souls of the old days dropped on the street from incarceration with nothing and nobody. Work release programs, halfway houses to nurture and offer a little oversight to verify things are laying out wonderfully. The main stairwell in the campus front of the big building, you can see it through the big glass. It starts to flicker, flashing and moving down. It must be her calves when she appears in the lower landing and hop land. Her laundry basket, she's hugging it kind of, her favorite shirt is on top, part crumbled up, her dirty laundry bounces like fruit. Uneven there are ones in there that are littler and mostly elastic, you can just about make them out under there in the bounce back. Nearing the laundromat, the warm smell of the air, and there is the clicker of the fabrics mopping the walls inside the containers. It is that strong electric hum and the constant rushing of air through the ducts. Most sounds are muted out. A falling mop handle on the floor would usually crack the room to attention, but not in the tumbling laundromat. She looked around in the smell of the warm laundry. She is stacking the basket empty on the washer lid, checked the dial and the clock on the wall. The third time she checked it, she nodded and walked out. She came into the afternoon looking around casually. She walked around a little, kicking her toes out and letting them come down slowly. She's acting like this is regular for her, discriminating against the bench, but sits on the tall curb the same way any renegade poet would. A little bit world-worn around the edges, she almost can't contain herself. This is so badass. When the time was up, she just sat there. She'd been still for the last minute looking out at the ocean, and so heavy and constant. The dial is kind of a jumping off point. Inside the rows of machines, you can get disoriented in there. The machine amongst the other machines, the one with the basket on the lid, said it had 17 minutes left on the dial. And it was in that overhang of spruce boughs that creates a cave in there. The sun becomes shattered into stars. It's when she approached it. The dog in the yard began to bark. She wriggled her fingers at the good boy. 
The poor thing acted like he's been chained his whole life. His lower eyes and cheek hang loose and he's barking steadily, the cheeks yielding to the move of the bone machinery that they're covering. When she walked into the spruce shadow cave over the pathway, she wasn't even looking. She was looking up at the boughs and there was a nest up high, her neckline stretched to her jaw, her chin in the softness stretched taut on itself, and her bra strap showed it was white. Maybe it was an omen. She picked up her laundry and folded it. She went through the big doors of the glass front, and as she double-stepped up onto the landing, she rounded the corner and the flicker flash began to move up the stairs. There is an old man somewhere, and he's tending to this and that, and there's a commotion from the wood barn. He looks sharply at something screeling and tumbling noise in there. He's putting down a glass jar of lacquer and a fine brush carefully. In earnest, he is limping, the part hobble of an aged man scurrying quickly to the wood barn. Back then, the halfway house was somewhere halfway between the hardware store and the bakery in town. The shelves were stocked with pioneer tools and supplies intermingled amongst the farmer's implements or things, the price of which are double or more than triple the one sitting next to it on the shelf. Stainless steel and the brass, the acid tongue copper and blocks of lead and zinc. The old salty store clerk is describing with his hands bent like raspy skeleton fingers that it's the electricity from the boat's motor that scans through the boat trying to bleed out into the salt water. And it will find a way through some piece of metal and it will begin to move through the plate or the bolts and turn them to powder. So you attach a zinc block here or there and the less noble zinc will sacrifice itself to the electron's path. And when this new shiny block of foam metal becomes corroded down to a brittle chalky chicken bone, you throw that one into the drink, and you fasten on a new one. He had walked up to him standing at the loose spools of wire the young man was wearing horn-rimmed glasses, and he had just a foot of it or so pulled out laying across his palm. He was rolling it in his other fingers, examining it. The old man bellies into the aisle, if you have any doubts, to go with the marine grade. The old man is frantic at the barn now, and he's rattling with the clumsy latch and the slat man door, as all hell is breaking loose in there. He comes into the shadows of the barn stalls, and it is as if someone is getting thrown against the walls, the giant breath heaving and frantic screeching almost as the old workhorse is coming apart at the seams in there. The old man wished he knew better, but he'd only brought the horse over from Delta Junction about a year ago. And he is kicking and stomping, his massive flanks are shivering, and the veins below his skin are so full as if to burst, the old man is hobbling quickly to call the vet doctor. It didn't quite sink in till the cop as he was standing half in the hallway, half in the room. Megan's door was open, and her friend was showing him the stacked laundry on the bed. Her hands were out, pleading, frustrated. Every time she reiterated that these were her number one outfits, and if Megan had went anywhere, she would have been wearing one of those. Her arms exasperated, palms up, what? The crushing moments of that first phone call up in Delta Junction must have sunken heavy like a million tons, the time fabric stretching down, looking up through a straw. And they are muffled up there, speaking of the most sincerest of words, and there are no walls inside for poor mother, and she becomes endless in all directions, and then it begins to pull even more. Held creaking, loaded like an octopus bow and arrow, it releases, and the sudden energy flowing all at once back through her again. And she gasps, and her eyes raise to the heavens, rolling back, and her heart crying out in heart waves for her daughter. The next two years were unbearable. After the 4th of July weekend, Megan's roommate reported her missing. At first, it seemed obvious that Megan had gone to visit her family for the holiday. But as Monday began, responsible Megan was nowhere to be found. 
She washed her clothes, took them home to fold and hang, and that was the last time anyone reported seeing Megan Emmerich. Her case is still unsolved. Mary Thill saw her girlfriend loading up on the docks they were heading out on the boat soon. Something didn't set right with Mary. Trying to figure out this unsettled feeling, she noticed they didn't have a backup engine. She came a few minutes later, hobbling down the deck, carrying lopsided at her own spare kicker. The scary thing is she tried to give them an extra motor. She knew something was wrong. And she was maybe the last person to talk to her alive. The friend went out on the water that day anyway. The waves were rolling over kitchen tables. And they were dumping on the beach the boat sat offshore, bobbing up and down, looking at the impassable white foam smashing onto the beach. It must have started to sink in right about then, that they'd be sleeping on the boat that night. July 5th, 1975. Mary Thill lived out on Lowell Point just south of town to the side of the bay that moves towards the sunrise. She awoke alone in her bed that morning, her eyes came open, already knowing and remembering at once that her husband Michael was still out of town building on that pipeline. Later that day, she'd called a friend if they could give her a ride into town. She wanted to stop by the library later, but she got dropped off straight to the bakery. The weather had seemed rough. Any word on how it was out there last night, she would have her ear out. The thing about being so close to a victim is, it could have been you. Not only that, it's hard on the people. For instance, when Mary was in high school, she tragically already lost both her parents. She had never turned bitter. She had stayed so kind and loving. To what end? It's tough on the ones right next to it. It was on the 5th they know for certain that the vessel her friend was on had become defeated, it says, and it started to turn back in the wind and the large waves. Fortunately, they had never touched down on the stones at Johnstone Bay. As they were motoring back in the steady up and down and occasional errant waves slapping the hull in a firework of foam, Mary stood watching the water at Lowell Falls, the mist of which twists out in the sea wind catching you in a spray sprinkle. Two minutes walk from the bakery. The report says that the boat reached town, that they were haggard and went through some experience. So it took them some time for her to make their way over. The windshield wipers had a clean swipe from the mist of the falls, wet on the glass as they pulled up to Mary's house. Her seven dogs were wild and leaping to the end of their chains. The food and water bowls were overturned and smeared. As she came out of the truck and started to make sense of it, the walls were beginning to become endless in her. She trusted everyone. So loving and kind, precious little soul, I'll never forget her. I loved her, it says. She was only 22 years old. Her and Michael had their whole lives ahead of them. She was taking a course at Avtec. Mary Thill had already overcome so much. Even with the loss of her parents, she was still very academic and was crowned prom queen. Her support system included her husband, his family, and her siblings. Tied to this close-knit community, even strangers could be family to Mary. Two years after Megan went missing Fourth of July weekend in Seward, Mary disappeared without a trace. No one has confessed to her or Megan's disappearance. The clicking thumbs of the suitcase pressing latches coming closed. Those first nights in the prison across the bay from town and Lowell Point were surreal. Eventually that first taste of free air almost singed his lips. He had to restrain himself. He wanted to fuck so bad. Loading up his trinkets, pulling up stakes, he'll be back on the streets of Anchorage by nightfall. One last gaze, he nods in approval at the irony, scanning the large, narrow Resurrection Bay. True Crime 49. Thank you for listening to TC49. You can find us online on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Join our Patreon for extra content and visit our website for shirts, mugs, and stickers. See show notes for sources and links.
In this episode, we use the name Barbara Fields to protect the survivor's identity.